Baltimore, Maryland is the current but not permanent home of one of the most striking and innovative ships ever put to sea. The NS Savannah is one of those rare vessels designed to impress with her yacht-like beauty and sculpted form. Now in her 62nd year, she looks every bit as modern and even futuristic as she ever has. The Savannah was America's floating ambassador to nuclear power. The only atomic American passenger and cargo ship ever built, she served her experimental purpose briefly, but nobly, during her eight-year career. In that time, she sailed 450,000 miles, carried 842 passengers, and hosted 1.5 million visitors in three dozen countries and is now on the National Register of Historic Places and is a designated national landmark. And that just barely scratches the surface. Now, after decades of obscurity and decay, her nuclear power plant has been safely removed and she shines like new, waiting for a permanent home. Time is not on her side, however. Savannah has just until the end of 2025 to find that home or she faces the possibility of reefing or scrapping. So join me, Peter Canego, and let's head aboard this American treasure, discover her fascinating backstory, and take a detailed top-to-bottom tour. Stepping aboard is like stepping back in time, especially when you arrive at the oh-so-mid-century main lobby. If only those bulkheads could talk, but since they can't, here is part of their story. In 1955, President Eisenhower authorized the world's first nuclear-powered merchant ship, which Congress approved in 1956. The renowned maritime architect George G. Sharp was employed to design a ship that would impress the world with her sleekness and futuristic beauty. Because she would emit no exhaust fumes, Savannah had no funnel and while she had seven cargo holds, to keep her more streamlined looking, she had only three pairs of cargo gear. Sharp's impressive design resume included the massively successful Victory ships built for World War II service and several passenger liners, beginning with the Panama Lines and Contrio of 1939. In 1941, he restyled the 1904 built liner Juniata into the streamlined modern ferry Milwaukee Clipper, which thankfully has been preserved in Muskegon, Michigan. The Clipper incorporated Sharp's first use of a dummy funnel, which evolved into the impressively rounded Delta Line Del Norte Trio of 1948 and the Barrett Class Troopship Trio of 1952. The rounded dummies were part of the superstructure, while the aft duct takes were the actual funnels. The whimsical Great Lakes liner Aquarama of 1956 was probably Sharp's most streamlined creation until the advent of the Savannah. His last passenger ships were the Grace Line Santa Magdalena Quartet of 1963 and 64. At the suggestion of American passenger ship historian Frank Brainerd, NS Savannah took her name from the first steamship to cross the Atlantic the 1819 built sail assisted paddle wheeler, the SS Savannah. This Savannah was also a steamship, but powered by a Babcock and Wilcox reactor that utilized enriched uranium oxide pellets in a chain reaction process to drive two De Laval steam turbines. It was housed just forward of the bridge in a containment vessel shielded by 2,000 tons of lead, polyethylene, timber, and concrete in case of collision. Along with the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Maritime Administration employed the New York Shipbuilding Corporation shipyard at Camden, New Jersey to construct the Savannah. On Maritime Day, May 22, 1958, the date of the SS Savannah's maiden crossing, Mrs. Pat Nixon, wife of the Vice President, used a radioactive wand held next to a Geiger counter that sent a signal to lay the keel in place.
construction proceeded over the next year with the installation of the containment vessel and the hull being built around it. On July 21, 1959, thousands of spectators attended the launch where Godmother and First Lady Mamie Eisenhower broke a bottle of champagne across the Savannah's bow, sending her graceful hull into the Delaware River. The fitting out process would take almost two and a half years until the ship was completed in December of 1961. In the interim, two cruise ships were given extensive training on a reactor simulator. 32 bundles of uranium fuel were installed in the reactor to begin the fission process, and on December 21, 1961, initial criticality was achieved. At that point, Savannah was conveyed from Camden to Yorktown, Virginia, where she began her sea trials. Between January and April of 1962, Savannah was put through every possible test. She maneuvered beautifully, reaching speeds of 23 knots and easily maintaining her required 21 knot service speed. Her initial fuel core would last six years and could take her around the world several times. On May 1, 1962, she was delivered to her operator, States Marine Lines, and in August, she began her maiden voyage as America's floating ambassador to peaceful nuclear power. 100,000 people watched her enter her namesake port of Savannah for the first time, and during her six-day call, 38,000 would queue up to visit the ship. After departing Savannah on August 28th, she stopped in Norfolk and then began her long journey to the U.S. West Coast via the Panama Canal. On October 1st, she stopped in Seattle for 20 days, hosting 60,000 visitors. Her next stop was San Francisco, where 49,000 visitors toured the ship during her week-long stay. From there, Savannah zigzagged around the Western Pacific with calls at Long Beach, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Portland, and San Diego before heading to Galveston. In Galveston, after a complex labor dispute, one of the consequences of introducing her radical new technology to a commercial shipping world, her crew was fired, leaving the ship detained for over a year while new crew was trained for new operators, American Export Lines. Under American Exports Management, Savannah would continue her international tour. The caveat was that her passengers were required to find hotels at their own expense when the ship was hosting port demonstrations. But according to this memo, they could leave their luggage on board. I wonder how that would go over in today's competitive cruise market. Despite those limitations, this passenger named Irving raved on his postcard that she was the best ship afloat. Life on board Savannah must have been pretty glorious during her passenger-carrying days. Her mere 60 guests enjoyed vast open soot-free decks with shuffleboard courts and a generously large swimming pool. Her promenade deck boasted chic and modern public spaces decorated by New York-based Harry Neefy, who was fresh from revamping Matson Line's Monterey into the stylish Hawaiian-themed Matsonia. The ellipse-shaped forward lounge boasted tables cut from slabs of petrified wood, a color television, and contemporary American artworks. 
An enclosed promenade surrounded this deck and the aft situated veranda overlooked the pool. Here there were evocative libations like the atomic cocktail and the bar splash featured a honeycombed aluminum fixture called Table of the Elements. It was very Jetsons meets Star Trek and simply glorious to fans of mid-century decor. The 30 staterooms were on a deck along with the barber shop and salon and the main lobby with its S-shaped Naugahyde settee. The staterooms were spacious and featured large portholes, bathrooms with showers, and a bedroom separated from the sitting area by a decorative plexiglass screens. At the foot of the main staircase on B deck, the dining room entrance featured a large bronze model of the SS Savannah, a red, white, and blue color scheme, and a large plaster mural called Fission behind the captain's table. Breakfast offerings were varied and numerous, including choices like boiled salt mackerel and veal kidney saute on toast. Of their time, lunch menus offered broiled swordfish with anchovy butter and salads with a choice of French, Russian, garlic, or mayonnaise dressing. Although brief, Savannah's passenger service went splendidly and without incident, save for the time when her reactor shut down during Hurricane Ethel and had to be manually overrided to restart and sail out of harm's way. Although Savannah remained popular and often fully booked, the expense and logistics of carrying passengers grew untenable. In 1965, her hotel staff were let go and Savannah soldiered on in a more modest, freight-only capacity. But even her freight carrying potential was hampered by the advent of containerization. As an experiment and ambassador for nuclear propulsion, she was a huge success, but her commercial viability, which was fortunately never part of the original plan, was another story. At one point, there was an unrealized proposal to turn her into a research ship with a helipad covering her pool deck. With her high operating costs amid the Maritime Administration's budget cutting, President Johnson authorized the funds to lay Savannah up. Her commercial service ended in 1970, and then after her fuel core was removed, she was sent to Savannah for planned use as a museum ship on the waterfront. Disputes over the costs and risks involved stalled those plans, and the ship sat in limbo until 1975, when she was dry docked in Baltimore, then taken to an army berth in North Charleston, before heading to Patriots Point to join the aircraft carrier USS Yorktown as a floating museum. In 1983, she was deemed a mechanical engineering landmark, and in 1991, she was designated a National Historic Landmark. But despite these honors, she failed to attract viewers and fell into disrepair, all of which was exacerbated by damage from Hurricane Hugo in 1989. After a minor flooding incident in 1992 found the ship in almost derelict condition, she was dry docked and repaired in Baltimore, then laid up in the James River Reserve Fleet. In May of 1998, I was granted permission to visit the ship, which by then had fallen on very hard times. The unrelentingly harsh weather in Virginia, along with years of neglect at Patriots Point and damage from Hurricane Hugo, had done Savannah no favors. But even knowing all that, I was still shocked by the ship's external cosmetic condition. Now dark and hauntingly silent, her promenades looked okay, but the odor of mold and mildew permeated her interiors, which were mostly stripped out and threadbare. The once festive lounge was missing its petrified wooden tables 
edgy furnishings, and contemporary American artwork. The only slightly less distressing veranda was just a shadow of its former self, but at least its hairy Nefi design elements were mostly intact. The bar stools were certainly battered, but the table of the elements backsplash was still there, along with those magnificent cocktail tables and even the color TV. I don't know if you saw it when you came over here, but put this oh, the it's over. God, her pool is still wide open. I can't believe it. I thought this would have been boarded up. Yeah. For 10 15. In between and even during the intermittent downpours, we explored the outer decks. From the aft docking wings, there was much to take in as the rumble of an approaching storm cell grew louder. Her aft port cargo boon was now home to an osprey nest. The signal flag spelling Savannah were still behind hold number six, but the peeling paintwork had begun to expose the gray primer coating on her once pristine dummy funnel-like dome superstructure. Lurking in the distance beyond her rounded bridge front, another sharp ship, the 1952 built State the former troop ship Barrett, which was last used as the training ship Empire State, awaited her appointment with the scrappers. From the top of Savannah's dome, we took in a sobering view over the stern and then headed down to the bridge and officer's quarters before the next deluge. Well, it was good to see that most of the bridge equipment was still there, if in need of some polish and TLC, and the chart room was basically intact, if a bit disheveled. The officers' quarters on boat decks seemed to have taken the brunt of the neglect with their abundant peeling paint, mold, and water ingress. From there, we headed down to the barber's shop on A deck where we had stowed our gear to that once magnificent mid century lobby where fans circulated the now stagnant air. Before heading down to B deck, we peeked in at the passenger staterooms which were pretty much devastated after Hugo. On sea deck, the splendid dining room was the most intact space with its glorious atom-shaped light fixtures and obtusely mid-century forms. And quite miraculously, that original carpet survives to this day. The bronze Savannah model was stowed away for safekeeping, but Pierre Bordel's nuclear fission plaster screen still loomed over the captain's table. From the dining room, we headed forward into the galley, then onwards towards the reactor and down to the engine room viewing gallery on sea deck. One can only imagine how many hours it took in line for her 1.5 million visitors to reach this unique vantage over the engine and control rooms. Yeah. 
That vast and complex control panel operated the reactor, the traditional steam power plant, and all the ship's other machinery. As we left the Savannah on that gloomy day, I wondered if I would ever see her again. Thankfully, her reactor, the very thing that hindered her commercial viability, guaranteed her many more years until it could safely be removed. In 2006, the remediation process began when Savannah was taken from the reserve fleet to Kelowna Shipyard in Norfolk, where exterior repairs were made and her interior was cleaned and disinfected. She was then moved to the North Shipco Shipyard, where she was eventually dry docked and repaired, emerging triumphantly in 2008. With her paintwork glistening anew, Savannah was next moved to Pier 13 in Baltimore, where she rests today. In 2012, I paid her my next visit, utterly thrilled to see all the restoration underway under the supervision of the U.S. Maritime Administration's Earhart Kohler. In September of 2019, Savannah was towed to the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard for a dry docking and pre-decommissioning work that included removal of the nuclear support systems in preparation for the reactor removal. On November 8, 2022, the reactor itself was removed and transported to a waste repository in Utah. From her flying bridge to her tank tops, Savannah has a total of 10 decks. Let's start at the top of her house with some footage I shot in 2012 simply because we didn't have enough time to get there during my 2024 visit. This is a view facing aft over the dome and this is facing forward from the top of the dome. Behind that wooden door, there's a staircase that leads down to Navigation Bridge Deck. Savannah has wide open bridge wings that are connected by a curved narrow terrace in front of the wheelhouse. The spotless wheelhouse has most of its original equipment intact and beautifully restored. Aside from a small scram warning light, there are no other indicators of the ship's nuclear power. SCRAM is actually an acronym for Safety Control Rod Axe Man and is used to describe the sudden shutdown of a reactor. Just look at all that beautifully polished brass and bronze. Even the helm chair has survived all these years. The chart room is directly aft on the port side and like the rest of the ship, looks ready for service.
Well, so like when I was DJing, and when kids started asking me what the hell a record was, I knew what's time for you to quit. <laughs> a wonderful old advertisement features three of my favorite American liners. And this is the control for the steam whistle. The radio room is directly aft on the starboard side, and just beyond that is the Sperry Gyro Compass. In the farthest aft part of the dome on this level is the ship's emergency generator. The main stair tower features a combination of black vinyl tile underlaying a sheet vinyl wrap that is printed with scanned images of the original tiles. Now how's that for impeccable restoration? Terraces under the davits continue aft on either side of Savannah's boat deck level to an open platform overlooking the stern. Especially from this perspective, George Sharp's domed housing achieves its goal in resembling a streamlined smokestack. The interior portion of boat deck is officer's territory, beginning on the forward port side with the chief engineer's quarters. Another distinctly George Sharp design element is the rounded edge of the room that conforms to the contour of the dome. On the Savannah, the top officers all enjoyed their own private bathrooms. Continuing towards the starboard side from the chief engineer's stateroom, a trio of smaller staterooms overlook the bow. Nestled in the starboard corner of boat deck, the captain's quarters has the same footprint as the chief engineer's. Even their bathrooms have the same tile pattern. The remarkable restoration of the boat deck officers' quarters has come a long way since the reserve fleet layup and continues to this day. Now let's have a look at that beautiful promenade deck. On promenade deck, an open terrace surrounds the reactor hold, which still supports the metal platform installed for the reactor's removal. Now let's head inside and see what lies beyond that space age facade. Almost resembling a portion of Disney's classic Monsanto ride, a row of polarized conical windows fronts the forward enclosed promenade. So let's circle this promenade in a counterclockwise direction to the wide glass enclosed terraces that were designed to accommodate deck chairs and perhaps a warm or cold potation. Now let's make a turn and navigate between the veranda on the left and the since covered pool on the right. Well, this about does it, although I can't say for certain how many laps make a mile. Okay, now let's take a peek at some of those glorious public rooms. On the starboard side, the former writing room leads to the oval-shaped lounge, which has been beautifully restored and is used for screenings and presentations. Up forward, a pair of frosted glass doors emblazoned with the atom symbol lead to the forward promenade. While the contemporary artworks and original furnishings are gone, one of the iconic petrified wood tables remains. The other is in the Smithsonian. 
Adjoining the lounge on the port side, the former library has historic displays and the Savannah's curvaceous half-hull builder's model. Back on the starboard side, a gift shop lines the passage as we head aft. And now for the veranda, the largest and quite possibly the most magnificent space, although the dining room, which we will soon see, might be just as brilliant. And by the way, this is a stair tower landing with its own distinct pattern that leads to the veranda. Up forward, there's a beautiful scale model of Savannah, and on the port side, the original color TV, along with the ship's music entertainment system, has been skillfully repaired by head docent Bob Adams. All six of the clocks, which feature Savannah, London, Washington, Moscow, Tokyo, and Honolulu time, have also been restored, at least cosmetically. Although clean and ultra 1960s modern Harry Neefy style, the closer you look, the more pleasing are the details. That curvaceously serrated settee is outstanding, but nothing tops these tables with the Star Trek Delta symbols, except the fact that they predated the show by six years. Like the rest of the ship, one can only hope they live long and prosper. The now red, white, and blue table of the elements is like a beacon for modernist aficionados, as are the engraved plaster polka dots. Steps aft, that large pool has now been covered, although the signal flags that spell Savannah remain unchanged for what is now 62 years. Just above and behind the flags are the large brass bell and builder's plate, true maritime treasures. On the aft docking platform, there's the emergency steering station and a wonderful panorama that stretches from the stern to the midship's flanks. A deck begins at the luxuriously long forecastle which is home to four cargo holds. While there's a nice shear here, its appearance is enhanced by designer George Sharp's flared bulwarks that contribute to Savannah's futuristic profile. Note how much taller they get as you move forward. They certainly don't make graceful bows like this anymore. Now let's have a look inside, starting with the barber shop and beauty parlor on the starboard side. Down to its salmon colored tile decking and original barber chairs, this is yet another beautifully preserved space. A bit ironically, the hospital is directly after the reactor space and was quite large and advanced for a ship that only carried 60 passengers. And now returning to those stair tower landings, here's the A-deck pattern at the entrance to the reception lobby. After all those years of neglect, this space has been completely restored to its original sci-fi splendor. On its forward bulkhead, there are aluminum plans of prom, A, B, and C decks, as well as a stylized map of the world. The port side displays feature Savannah memorabilia and a model of the ship's namesake.
On the starboard side, there's a detailed model of the ship, her historic bronze plaques, and more nicely displayed memorabilia. And at the aft end of this sea of polished vinyl decking and melamine is the reception desk, looking ready to receive passengers once more. If ever there was a practically perfect example of how to preserve a passenger ship, this would be it. Although the ship's staterooms were ravaged by time and neglect, at least one has been largely restored. All outside, with private facilities and Jack Haney's stylish modern touches, they were the height of early 60s seagoing comfort. And don't get me started on these lamps. Many of the other staterooms have been partially restored and are being used as office space for the ship's docents and crew. Others are a work in progress, undoing decades worth of decay. Especially nice is the variety of decorative detailing, like the different screen patterns, and once again, those crazy cool lamps. These rooms have been converted into museum display areas, and nearby, there's a conference room. Continuing aft of the A-deck former passenger accommodations, there are newly installed public restrooms, which are especially convenient on tour days. Savannah's five-bladed bronze screw now rests atop hold number seven. And just a few more steps aft, we've arrived at the spotless fantail looking every bit as pristine as it did in its heyday. On B-deck, the hold areas have been spruced up beautifully with sections converted into useful space. The main stair tower concludes on this level, leading to the magnificent dining room. Guarding the entrance, and once again proudly greeting visitors, is that bronze model of the SS Savannah. It is pretty remarkable that these light fixtures, now fitted with LED bulbs, still cast their glow on fittings that would make Jackie O proud. Now let's take a closer, more detailed look at Pierre Bordel's nuclear fission panel. New York-based French expat Bordel also did the murals in the SS America's first-class dining room. Rendered in layers of plaster, the composition and textures are awe-inspiring. In the center of the room, there's a vitrine with Savannah's custom table service, and the captain's table is set with the remaining original chairs. And yes, that's the original carpeting. Like the rest of the ship, the galley is absolutely spotless and still features its original tile decking, as well as its pioneering Raytheon microwave oven. The officer's mess is on the port side of the dining room, and several nearby crew cabins have been restored and repurposed.
This classroom training area with its period sympathetic decor was built into the number three hold on C deck. Nearby, there's the engine room observation gallery that allowed visitors to see the turbine gear and the control room, a unique feature that lends itself to the ship's future preservation. But even more unique, now with the removal of the reactor, visitors can enter the actual reactor space. This is one of the four foot wide sections of steel, timber and concrete that were cut out of the containment vessel wall where visitors enter. I'm pretty certain the Savannah is the only property in the world where visitors can actually enter a once active reactor space. While the ship's mid-century design aesthetics and history are enough to merit preservation, this may actually end up being her most coveted attraction for future visitors. Among the other spaces located on sea deck, there's the laundry facility. On D deck, there's that famous control room with its vast panel with its own scram button and the propulsion throttle controls. Just forward and outside of the control room is the De Laval turbine machinery. And behind the control room there's the machinery equipment room. So we'll wrap it up here at the very bottom of the ship on hold deck, where of course, Shaft Alley is located. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed this detailed look at the Savannah. Her design, history, and uniqueness should be enough to guarantee her preservation for future generations. And the fact that she's already been restored and made viable as an attraction should, in a more perfect world, assure a permanent home. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, if you enjoyed this, please do hit like, and if you haven't already, subscribe. Oh, and just one more thing. These two DVDs are excellent resources on the Savannah. You can find them and more information on the ship, as well as information on ship tours at www.ns-savannah.com dot com.